Now that we've got all of our prerequisites installed, let's go ahead and get ready to bootstrap our ASP.NET Core application using OpenAPI Generator. To simplify this for you, I've created a bootstrapping project. You can reuse this for any project that you want to do contract first API development with ASP.NET Core in the future. All you've got to do is swap out the API spec file and maybe change some settings in the generate script. So I'm going to clone this repository, recursive, because it also pulls in a sub-module that has customized templates for us. And if I go into this directory, we'll see that we have a Docker Compose file that I've created that will let us run the entire application locally in containers. I have a shell script for running the OpenAPI generator so that I don't have to remember all the command line flags that I want. I have a Helm chart for deploying this application into OpenShift or what other Kubernetes service you might be using. I've got those customized templates for use with the OpenAPI generator. Uh, these templates, the reason I'm using custom templates instead of what's built in is because I wanted a little more type safety than what the current defaults are. I am working on contributing these back upstream to the OpenAPI generator project and hopefully in the near future these will not be necessary anymore. Finally, we've got our OpenAPI specification file. And you can see we've defined paths, methods, uh, different HTTP verbs, response types, data types, exactly what you would expect in an OpenAPI specification. From that, we can generate our new ASP.NET Core project. So you'll see that after we run generate, we've got a build batch file, a build shell file. We've got a readme file, a solution file, and a source directory. And when we look at our source directory, we'll see that it's generated a complete ASP.NET project for us. And that includes the models that were defined in the API specification and the controller stubs, and I've defined this to mainly create controller stubs intentionally so that we can implement our own business logic. So let's open this up in our development environment. I'm going to use VS Code with a set of plugins for ASP.NET Core, and we should be able to now see ah, it's telling us some of the assets to build and debug are missing. This is asking us, should we run .NET Restore? I'm going to let it run Restore so that it, the IDE is familiar with all the things that are included in our project. And let's take a look. We have our models. And this is just a plain POCO that describes a to-do. Uh, and it has a good for an ID has a title, a description, is it complete or not, what its due date is, and then we have the typical boilerplate operations we need for a POCA. Our API model controller is stubbed in like this. We've got a, a class default API controller that's annotated as an API controller, and it has abstract methods on it that are annotated for REST API operations and Swagger documentation. But no implementation. We have to supply the implementation ourselves. But most of the boilerplate is done for us. All we have to do is implement this class, fill in the business logic for these methods, and our API is done. Now, when you're using OpenAPI Generator in a contract-first approach, I highly recommend that you never contribute any of the generated code to version control. So to support that, inside of our gitignore file here, that's under source red hat to do list, I'm going to tell it to ignore all the files that were generated that I will never modify. So all of these files, at least as far as I'm concerned for this project, I will never modify and so they should never be included in version control. But you might notice not every file that was generated is in this list or handled by these 
glob patterns. And those include startup, program, and app settings.json because we are going to modify those. And since we're going to modify those, we never want OpenAPI Generator to overwrite them in the future. And so what we can do is when we generate a project from OpenAPI Generator, it creates an ignore file and we can tell it program.cs startup.cs app settings.json. And now if we ever rerun our generate script, these files will not get overwritten. Excellent, exactly what we want. Now I'm going to create a new folder to hold our business logic implementation for our controller. I'm going to call it controllers impl. And controllers impl is going to allow us to uh, have a place to store our implementation code that won't be ignored for version control. So I'm going to go to implementation and it's going to say there is no implementation. Okay. So we're going to command palette uh, C sharp I thought there was a way in Visual Studio Code. Darn, I was really hoping I could implement doesn't look like that's possible in Visual Studio Code. Uh, I know it is possible in Visual Studio and in Rider to highlight this and create an implementation from it. Unfortunately, Visual Studio Code does not have that. So we're going to say new file. We're going to call this default API controller impl.cs. Namespace is going to be the same namespace as what we have here. We want the namespace to match because we're just going to be extending that class. And we're going to say public class default API controller impl extends default API controller. And once we do that, we're going to get this squiggly line saying, hey, you need to implement all the methods from that abstract class. So we'll click on that little button to have the IDE generate most of that for us. It's also warning us that we don't have our comments for our documentation. I'm not going to worry about that right now. But at this point, we can actually go in here to our project and run .NET run. And I want to show you real quick, I my to-do API I have in Apicurio, which is where I created the API. You can see all my paths and my data types. When Apicurio generates the documentation, it's using Redoc, but you can see we've got get all to-dos, post a to-do, get a single to do, update it to do, or delete it to do. Once we run our application, uh, oh, one thing I did forget is right now port 8080 is in use. So I need to go down here into program, change the port number to 8081. And now I can run it successfully. There we go. And you'll see that we actually get our Swagger documentation exactly as we would expect. We've got our to-dos, our gets. Now none of these will work because if you look at the generated code 
from our implementation, all of these methods just say throw new not implemented exception. And we can confirm that if we go down here and we say try it out and we execute exactly what we expected. 500 error and the error is method or operation is not implemented. Perfect. Exactly what we would expect. 